What's up guys, it's Chili here. Last week I asked you guys out of all the potential options that I can think of at least, which kind of variant concept uh, would you expect to see in the uh, perhaps a future expansion. So, so far we have four of the base civs, they all got a variant uh, civ as well. So that's China with Jushi, France with John Dark, uh, HRE with the Order of the Dragon, and uh, the Abbasids with the Ayyubids. And so we have four base civs left in AoE4 that don't have a variant, so everyone's basically speculating that uh, if they are to add new variant civs, it'll probably be those four base civs, uh, those being the English, the Rus, the Delhi Sultanate, and the Mongols, I think. I think those are the remaining base civs. Uh, and then Malians and Ottomans shortly afterwards, hopefully, assuming that <laughs> development continues on this game. Uh, now, for the English, uh, the I did discuss that uh, there, you know, a lot of people have been speculating what kinds of variant potentials there could be for the English. Uh, I mentioned the Normans, uh, centered around maybe like a William the Conqueror type of character. Uh, is considering, especially considering the fact that we already have a Norman, uh, the Normans featured in the campaign, uh, with a lot of uh, campaign-specific units that could potentially be recycled for multiplayer play, um, and then. Another one that I was thinking would be a really popular choice would be uh, Richard the Lionheart, which is centered around the Crusaders, especially the Third Crusade, which is the crusade that Richard uh, led himself. Um, and there are a lot of Crusader assets in the campaign as well, especially in the Sultan's Ascent campaign, since that was depicting the Muslim side defending from uh, Christian invaders. Uh, the other two that I could think of were maybe like Saxon kingdoms, uh, like the Kingdom of Mercia or something like that. Um, and then the last thing that I thought would be maybe interesting is like a like a Tudor focused England or something like a Elizabethan England, maybe uh, something that could be really cool. This is a little bit out of the time scope of AOE4, but like maybe like a like a cult a, a cult like faction centered around John D, uh, who was uh, famously kind of like this alchemist uh, wizard like character um, serving under Elizabeth. Uh, so. There's a lot of potential options that they can go with. Um, a lot of you guys also mentioned wanting to see other cultures and, and nations that are around the British Isles being represented, like uh, Scotland, for instance, or Wales. Uh, I think Scotland and Wales or even Ireland uh, would all make amazing factions, but probably not an English variant. Uh, so far, the variant civs in AoE4 have been um, a little bit all over the all over the place. There's not exactly like one strict guideline for how to make a variant civ, um, but they tend to at least follow one basic rule, which is that uh, most of the assets are relatively low budget. They're either going to be kit bashed uh, assets or they're going to be reused from the uh, campaign in some way, uh, reused from assets that were already present in the campaign rather. Um, and mostly focusing on like some new gameplay additions. So for instance, like in the Order of the Dragon, we just got a bunch of reskinned uh, HRE units. Um, for uh, France, uh, a lot of the unique units that were present there are just units that we see from the campaign. Um, for Jushi's Legacy, their new landmarks are just kitbash versions of China's uh, uh, buildings. So uh, because of that, I don't think it would be doing uh, this a civilization like Scotland justice if they were added as an English variant civ. Um, and they don't seem to be adding new audio or music, uh, like speech recordings or music recordings for the variant Civ. So I feel like that would be such a waste. Like if I had a Scot Scottish Civ and I didn't hear um, like bagpipes or something like that, and I didn't have like uh, Highlanders with unique animations, like it just seems like I wouldn't really want to play that Civ personally. Um, so for that reason, uh, I don't think a like a Scottish or a Welsh Civ would work very well. Uh, but uh, out of the ones that I did offer here, it looked like the most popular option for you guys was Richard the Lionheart, um, which was a little bit surprising to me. I honestly expected something like uh, William the Conqueror or maybe the Saxon Kingdoms personally. I didn't realize that, I mean, as an American, I, I didn't realize that Richard the Lionheart was such a popular figure. I've definitely seen him depicted in a lot of media before, um, but I didn't quite know that he was as as well known and popular among among the AoE 4 community as he is. Uh, he was featured in a campaign back in AoE 2, um, but I didn't really play AoE 2, so I don't know much beyond that. I just know that he was in that game. Um, 
And yeah, anyways, I, I was thinking through it and I was like, okay, this, this is an interesting direction. And I was already speculating on like what a Crusader Civ could look like in the game. Uh, I had some ideas jotted down. Um, and it's kind of a shame that we didn't get a Crusader Civ with the Sultan's Ascend expansion. It seemed like a obvious shoe in but you know, that's water on the bridge. I do hope that we get a Crusader Civ in the future, especially since it's such a popular topic. I think it would uh, push a lot of units out um, and it, and people would really like it. So I was thinking, okay, well, it might be a waste to have a Crusader Civ fully fledged civilization considering there would be a lot of cultural overlap, maybe like the music and the voice lines would pick, probably overlap with uh, a lot of existing civilizations. I'd rather get like more diverse selections for fully fledged civs in the future. Uh, personally, my favorites are either the Khmer or the Aztecs uh, where there's a lot of potential diversity there. Um, very, very unique music, voice lines, units, play styles, all of that. I think that would be uh, way more fruitful of a, of a full full Civ than a Crusader Civ. So why not make the Crusader Civ the variant civilization for England? Um, and that's the basis for this Civ. And I will now start talking about uh, my concept here. Um, I was thinking through, uh, and, and I'll, I'll walk you through here. Uh, I have this, uh, this set up on uh, this setup on Figma over here, and let me see if I can get the... Okay, sure, I can have the highlighter on. Um, Alright, so first of all, Richard the Lionheart, this is the variant civ that I'm proposing for England. Uh, it is centered around the titular uh, character Richard the Lionheart, who was the English king that led the Third Crusade. Uh, very popular figure in medieval folklore, um, very, very fondly remembered king, uh, also featured oftentimes in a lot of uh, stories depicting um, uh, other characters that you might have heard of, like Guy de Lusignan, uh, who was the antagonist back in um, uh, Kingdom of Heaven, and Richard the Lionheart actually makes an appearance in Kingdom of Heaven. Uh, he's actually played by uh, the same guy that played Jorah Mormont. Um, Ian Glenn, I think his name is, a uh, really, really talented actor here. Um, and yeah, I, I had to, when I watched it the second time uh, in the past year, I was like, what the heck? That's Jorah Mormon over there. What's he doing here? Um, that's kind of crazy. And uh, yeah, we also see him in, in a bunch of other movies. Sean Connery played him once. Um, very, very popular uh, figure. Um, oh, even uh, back in Medieval 2 Total War, the guy on the box art, this is very clearly uh, Richard the Lionheart, right? It's got the uh, it's got this kind of metal helmet with the crown on top of it. Um, it, it just seems like a very distinct uh, look. Uh, and it's also kind of a generic look for an English king. So I can see why he's like depicted in so many different games. Um, the art that I have here uh, is actually from Crusader Kings 3. Speaking of Crusaders, uh, at least I think it's from Crusader Kings 3. I never actually played Crusader Kings. I've tried getting into it a few times, but every single time it just gets way too complicated for me. Um, but uh, this art is also by Craig Mullins, who is the same uh, artist for the, who does all the uh, cover arts for uh, Age of Empires. So I was like, well, I'll just take this Crusader piece that he did over there and place it over here. Uh, it's a good stand-in for um, what could potentially in the future be a much more uh, awesome and relevant uh, picture. But in this case, it does do a good job of depicting uh, the Crusaders. I added this little like girl gold floral here just to make it seem a little bit more fitting for the AOE4 context. Um, all right, so uh, the English Civ as a base is very interested in long range archers, really heavily focused on defense. Their armies are typically slow moving because their longbows are so slow. Uh, they don't really have too much of a focus on cavalry, but they do have a lot of focus on heavy infantry. Their men at arms are really, really tanky. Uh, really accessible. They build faster. They can. They're available earlier. Um, uh, so really heavily armored units. Um, slow moving good defenses, and farms. A very static base that's kind of, uh, usually you see English bases being very tightly knit uh, and basically impenetrable because they have so many defensive bonuses going for them. The the network of castle uh, buff, which can be upgraded to network of citadels, which gives 40% bonus attack speed uh, whenever they're fighting around towers and keeps and, and town centers. Uh, it's pretty ridiculous trying to go up against an English base. So that's their core identity. And uh, I wanted to take that and do a little bit of a flip on that uh, while keeping some base mechanics in play uh, without changing too much and giving a very very distinct new gimmick so uh, here, here's my opinion on the variant sibs if you haven't heard me discuss this before um, 
There are four variant sieves right now, Jushi, Jean d'Arc, Ayubids, and uh, Order of the Dragon. Out of those four, I think two of those sieves are very, very, very weak designs, and two of those sieves are pretty strong designs, but maybe could use a little bit of balancing tweaks to uh, get it uh, all the way up there. So. The two that I think are really, really poor for the game are Drushi's Legacy and the Ayubids. Uh, these are two of the strongest sieves in the game uh, right now, as of January 2024. Um, they are borderline broken, even, and not a lot of people are talking about them because they're not very heavily played in uh, lower elo, but in higher elo, they're very, very dominant. Uh, and the reason, and I, the reason why I think that these are such badly designed sieves is that their core identities are functionally the same as the base sieve. Um, uh, for instance, the Ayubids are, they still have the House of Wisdom, uh, they still have the Golden Age mechanic, uh, they still have camels, uh, they just have more camels. They have uh, a different kind of House of Wisdom age up mechanic, but it's kind of functionally the same with the different wings. Um, they have slightly different Golden Age bonuses, but it's basically, it feels the same. And so when you play the Ayubids, it doesn't feel too much different than playing the Abbasids. Essentially, you're playing like a faster version of the Abbasids. You can fast castle ridiculously quickly. You can even fast Imperial uh, within 11 minutes. It's kind of ridiculous what this faction can do. Um, and you can get more camels out, more units out. And you can also get bigger siege weapons out. So it's it kind of plays like a better version of the base sieve, which means that when you're thinking about which sieve that you want to play, you're not really making a clear and meaningful choice. You're just basically picking the one that uh, is currently balanced stronger, and that happens to be at the Ubids right now. So Abbasids are going to be a lot less popular, the Ayubids are going to be a lot more popular. Same thing goes for Jushi. Uh, the Ju Jushi's Legacy faction, uh, it plays very, very, very similar to China. Yes, some hardcore China mains will be sticklers and say like, oh, like you get more Imperial officials or the, the, or the lack of the Barbican is a big deal, but like, yes, there there's like some small tweaks here and there that will make playing the faction feel a bit different if you're if you're a hardcore fan of that faction. But for the majority of people, like this is just China 2.0. It, it Jushi gets their uh, Jush, Jush, they get their Juganus out much faster. Uh, they get their age ups much faster. They can get relics much faster. They can do their farming transition much faster. Um, everything about this faction just feels like the base version of China, uh, just faster and smoother. Um, and so for that reason, it's like. It, 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 it muddies the waters and doesn't really make you feel like there's too much distinctness happening and you're not making a meaningful choice when you're picking one, one sieve or the other to play. Uh, Jean d'Arc, on the other hand, as well as the Order of the Dragon, um, they play very differently from their base sieve, uh, or at least uh, meaningfully differently uh, based on just a few small tweaks so they don't have too many too many new unique units they don't have too many new unique technologies uh, but they do have a core gimmick that makes that faction distinct and makes you think entirely differently while playing something that is very similar to the same faction so for Jean d'Arc everything's centered around the hero and you're always thinking about how to level up that hero get her up as early as possible you want to take out the boar you want to take out the 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 wolves you want to um engage in a lot of early combat and you want to just like focus on leveling her up rather than caring as much about your own economy uh same thing goes for order the dragon all of your units are much stronger but they're also much more expensive and it also goes for your villagers. You don't have prelates that can buff up your villagers anymore. So instead of being more uh, centered around the Akintropel, you are now trying to go out on the map. You're doing age two aggression. You are hunting more. Uh, so order just you think very differently despite the faction having a lot of same properties that's what i wanted to do with uh with this uh richard the lionheart civilization as well so the core gimmick here is the crusades i want to take the crusader concept and uh basically elevate that to the be the core gimmick that this civilization is built around and that is this ability called call to crusade um every 10 minutes you will have a crusader army arrive at your main town center. I don't want to specify too much about what exactly that crusader army is composed of. I'm imagining some kind of assortment of units that are relevant to the age that you're in. So if, if, if this is being called in the feudal age, you get some horsemen, and some archers, maybe some spearmen, maybe a mix of all of them, maybe some unique units uh, tossed in there as well, maybe units from other factions even, um, maybe they're upgraded, or maybe they're like crusader specific units. Uh, I'm not too sure how exactly I would want to think about this. Um, I'm going to leave that up for whoever wants to balance this. I just want to be vague. Vaguely say 
some kind of crusader army, you can fill in the blank there. Uh, but at the head of this crusader army is Richard the Lionheart, which is a hero unit uh, for this faction. Now, Richard the Lionheart is a hero unit, but he's not exactly like Jean d'Arc, uh, where the whole faction is centered around Jean d'Arc and you actually have to level her up and she has a QWER like a mobile, like a MOBA hero. Uh, Richard the Lionheart is instead just like the English King unit, uh, which is already like this powerful knight unit that can heal units around it. Richard Lionheart's very similar, just a little bit stronger and a little bit, uh, uh, and the civilization focuses on him a little bit more. Um, and so in this case, uh, every 10 minutes you get to call in the Crusader army. Um, everyone can see when the Crusader army will arrive. So this give you, gives you a big boost uh, whenever you hit that like 10 minute mark. Um, you can wait until that 10 minute mark. That's when you uh, mass up your army and then you attack and you have a big overwhelming attack potentially. Or you maybe play more greedily and then in 10 minutes uh, that army will appear and will be able to defend your greed um, even while the opponent's pushing you in. So there's a lot of different ways you can play around this and I think that that's that has a lot of potential. Uh, the next uh, pa the next next civilization feature here is called Reclaim the Holy Land. I don't know if I necessarily want to make references to the Holy Land here, but I'll just use it because I'm I was too lazy to think of anything else. Um, in this case, uh, the Call to Crusade ability will arrive faster depending on the number of sacred sites that you have under your control. So this is a really interesting uh, feature to add to the Civ because it forces the English player to think completely differently. So normally the English players are not, uh, they're all about central a central base they're all about defending their base having a lot of farms up and defending that like small tight area that they have um this civ for this civ i want you to think completely differently i want you to play english in a way that gets out onto the map focuses on capturing sacred sites maybe you even want a fast castle so that way you can capture the sacred sites faster um there's a lot of ways you can play around this, but once you get those sacred sites, you can speed up the number of call to crusade, uh, the number of call to crusades you get, the number of reinforcement crusader armies that you get, which is obviously a, a big way to get tempo in this game, uh, with with this faction. Um, now there are some issues here where perhaps like depending on the map or depending on whether in team games or or one v ones, it can get a little bit more convoluted. Like if you capture the sacred sites, does that mean the Delhi player on your team doesn't get the benefit of the sacred sites? That's kind of a weird oversight that I think the devs have left in there. It's already kind of bad that like if you have two Delhi players on the same team, they're kind of they're kind of fighting for who gets to control the sacred sites. Um, I would like to see the devs kind of like come up with a fix for that. Uh, I'm not sure what exactly it would be, but as it is, I'm just going to say these guys, they want to capture sacred sites and I'll let the devs, devs like figure it out uh, beyond that because there, there needs to be a fix there. Um, all right, so you do get Richard the Lionheart. He's a powerful hero. As I mentioned earlier, he's like a king. He will passively hear, heal ne nearby units and he will uh, upgrade with each age that you, uh, you go through. He does get a unique ability, which is that uh, I, I'm calling it Invincible because uh, I'm a little bit boring. I couldn't think of a better name and I just watched the show. Uh, all units around Richard are briefly invulnerable and they cannot, which means that they cannot take damage for about three seconds. Uh, so this is a, uh, a really important ability that you want to time. Maybe it's like the moment the Manganel hit is about to smash all your archers to pieces. You, uh, you pop this ability and it gives you just a little bit more staying power. So it makes you have to be... Um, a little bit more active with where you want to position Richard and uh, when you want to use his ability. Um, so I think this is going to be a little bit more fun than just like the base, uh, the base king. Um, a little bit more active. It's it's game changing enough where you care about Richard, but not so, not so broken like the current Jean d'Arc implementation that uh, she can just w run rampant and Richard can just go kill everybody by himself. Um, all right, now the next. Uh, feature here is the order chapter. Uh, now, this is a really interesting thing to add. Um, basically, with this faction, you get access to all of the uh, uh, um, uh, basically what, what were they called? Uh, the, the the medieval crusader knight knightly orders. So the Templar order, the Teutonic order, and the Hospitaller order. All of these orders had a strong presence in the Holy Land during the Crusades, uh, and they were featured in the campaign for. Um, uh, for the Sultan's Ascent. In fact, we have their assets here. Here you can see exactly what the Teutonic, uh, sorry, the Teutonic Knights in the middle, the Hospitaller Knights on the right, and the Templar Knights on the left, as well as their Grandmaster forms as well. Uh, and you, you can see that we have all these all these assets in the game right now. So I, I was imagining that we could just reuse these assets because they look pretty cool. And like, I, I would hate to see this go to, go to waste, especially this uh, this uh, Teutonic Knight Grandmaster. He's got this like badass helmet with the, with the wings on top. Uh, I definitely want to see that in game. Um, 
So anyways, the idea here is that you get this unique structure that you can build starting in H3. Uh, it's called the Order Chapter, and you choose to ally with either the Templars, the Teutonic Order, or the Hospitaller Order. And once you ally with them, it, it's kind of like the mercenary companies for the Byzantines. Once you choose one of these uh, uh, groups to ally with, whenever you build another Order Chapter, you can always train uh, units from that order. Uh, so. Just to briefly take a look at it, here is the Order Chapter building. It's unique to Richard the Lionheart, as you can see here. Uh, and here are the potential knights that you can train. Uh, the Templar Knight is a knight with a powerful charge and will charge more frequently. Uh, the the Teutonic Knight is a man-at-arms with high health and armor but low attack. So this is a very tanky type of unit. So this is very similar actually to the uh, English man-at-arms. Um, I'm getting rid of the ability for this faction to get the chatted arms, the armor cladding uh, technology here, and instead there's going to be centered around this Teutonic Knight. If you do want to have that playstyle uh, as the base English, you could, but you have to go the Teuton you have to go to the you have to go the Teutonic Knight. Um, and lastly, for the Hospitaller Knight, this is more of a support unit. It's kind of like a warrior monk. I think even the model kind of looks like a warrior monk here. Um, and uh, it, it will heal nearby units with each attack that it does. Uh, and then. You, uh, in H4, you get access to the uh, Grand Master of that respective order. You can only build one of these, obviously, and they will buff up your units uh, further. So, for instance, Templar Knights will do additional damage, Teuton uh, Teutonic Knights will receive even less damage, and Hospitaller Knights will heal even more. Um, so it just kind of buffs up and makes them even better at the job that they're trying to do. Uh, now, this technology here is pretty important. Uh, so this is available in H3. It's called I'm calling it Holy Land. and it, it, what it does is that your order units can now claim sacred sites and gain a one-time influx of gold uh, when they when they do so. So this is the way that I want to really incentivize how this faction can um, go for sacred sites. So instead of having to build a uh, build a monastery and train monks and pump them out, and then you can go on to the sacred site that kind of takes away tempo from training using that gold to train units using that wood to create production structures instead you build an order chapter you get this technology and you can just pump out knights that can capture sacred sites um i think this would be really powerful and give this faction a lot of map presence and especially uh, allow them to contest sacred sites uh, all right, and then the influence mechanic for this faction is also slightly different. So, uh, for the base English, uh, for the base English faction, your farms are cheaper, and when you build farms around your mill, uh, they will gather faster based on the age that you're in. I wanted to change that just a little bit, just a little bit. I wanted to keep the same influence mechanic for the most part. But I do want to incentivize uh, um, Richard the Lionheart players to uh, try to get out onto the map earlier. So I want to encourage, I want to create an English faction that likes hunting, that likes going out onto the map and building outposts everywhere and taking map control. Um, so to encourage that, instead of your farms being cheaper, uh, you don't get that. And you also don't get any farming bonuses by default. Instead, your farming bonuses come each time you activate the Call to Crusade effect. So each time you get the Crusader reinforcements, your farms will gather 10% faster. And you can imagine like, you know, pilgrims are coming in and helping out with farms or something like that. Um, and so uh, what, what this means is that it really encourages you to play onto the map early. You wanna go for your hunts, you want to uh, capture the sacred sites and defend those sacred sites so you can get the Call to Crusade more and more often. And then in the late game, once you get you know, 20, 30% faster farms, now you can take advantage of that and set up your farm transition and, uh, and, and play for the late game. Um, so it plays more and more like English as you get to the late game, but um, uh, it's very different in the early uh, area. And I did keep the enclosures mechanic in this case. Uh, so you, you do still generate gold in the Imperial Age. So I'm keeping this the same. Uh, the, the, the Rich of the Lionheart uh, faction will play similar to the English in the, in the super late game, at least on their economic macro uh, side of things. Um, I'm keeping the keep production. So uh, base English has the ability to have their keeps produce all military units. I'm not making any change to that. But uh, very distinctly, you'll see that there is a lack of the network of castles bonus. So uh, one of the weaknesses of this faction compared to base English is that they lack network of castles. So they do not get the 20 to 40% bonus attack speed. Um, they also lack uh, as I mentioned earlier, any men in arms bonuses. Their town center doesn't shoot farther, it doesn't shoot multiple arrows. Their villagers also don't have range attacks. So you lose a lot of the defensive bonuses that make English such a strong defensive faction. Uh, you also have, you also lack shattering projectiles, which we all know is a game changing technology for the English. That's the one that makes the, um, the tre their trebuchets uh, deal more damage to uh, regular units. 
no one really gets this technology anyways so i was just like there's no point in including it um but to make up for these weaknesses you do get access to order knights you do get access to this powerful hero unit uh you do get to summon this army of crusaders so you're much more uh, focused on going out onto the map and uh getting a lot more tempo uh rather than holding up in your base and just uh trying to boom out um all right uh yeah so for their units uh barracks just a very basic barrack spearmen and men in arms um, their longbowmen is still available, and they still get the arrow volley uh, active ability. But keep in mind, their longbowmen do not get the network of uh, do not get the benefit of network of castles, so they're not as strong in the late game. They can still you can still do the longbow rush in the early game. It's still really strong uh, in the feudal age, but uh, it will fall off compared to the English longbow uh, in the late game. The same thing goes for the crossbowmen and the hand cannoneer. Uh, they will they will fall off compared to the base English faction. Uh, horsemen and knights are also kind of uh, just default, and their siege workshop is pretty default. They do keep the access to the Rebaltquin, which is what the English get as well. Um, I didn't want to make too many changes there. Uh, and let's see here. Um, oh, Pilgrim Banks here is another technology for the Order chapter that I want to talk about, which is just uh, the the Templars were known for uh, being creating what, what was potentially the first banking system in the world because uh, they would protect pilgrims traveling from one end of Europe all the way to the uh, Holy Lands in the Middle East. So uh, pilgrims needed to uh, bring their valuables with them and so one way they could do that is they could drop it off at uh one station and then uh, as long as they have the uh, credit they can pick it up in in the new station on, on the in the holy land so uh so a pseudo banking system it's just, which is one of the things that made the templars so powerful so i wanted to make a reference to that here and all it does is just makes your order units a bit cheaper um it, which makes uh, these kinds of units a bit more spammable. So you could rely on a build that focuses on more of these uh, unique uh, order knights. Um, all right, for, let's see, I will actually talk about, well, actually, I'll, I'll talk about here, uh, uh, this technology here, fanaticism. It is a one of the uh, unique technologies available to the civilization. Um, you might imagine this being available in the blacksmith, perhaps. I'm not, I haven't really thought about where exactly this would be available, uh, but it's available in H3, and all it does is all your units that arrive from Crusade will have innate plus 30% attack speed. So if you get an army of horsemen, an army of knights, an army of men at arms, or an army of archers, um, they will have an innate 30% attack speed. This is very similar to the 20% attack speed that the Delhi soldiers get from the Tower of Victory when they uh, train, um, let's say, a hand cannoneer from a uh, archery range as within the influence of the uh, Tower of Victory. They will have an innate 20% attack speed. You can think of this as being very similar. Basically, it gives you it gives you the bonus of uh, making your Crusader units that much more powerful. So this faction doesn't have the 40% attack speed bonus from the Network of Castles, but they do have this innate 30% attack speed bonus. So a uh, slightly different way to think about uh, how to get your attack speed bonuses here. Um, let's talk about their landmarks before I... These technologies are all related to the landmarks, so I'll, I'll move on to the landmarks here. Um, all right, their council hall. Uh, pretty standard English landmark. It's the one that everyone goes for uh, right now, and I wanted to keep it the same. I don't want to make too many changes here, so this is exactly the same. It's an archery, it's, it's an archery range that works twice as fast, um, and I even found this really awesome picture of uh, basically what the structure looks like in real life, and you can even see like the windows and the, the triangle-shaped uh, vaulting here. Um, it's, it's amazing how similar it looks, actually. Uh, it's really cool. All right, uh, Abbey of Kings. Now, this is a landmark that I made a twist on because no one really builds this landmark right now. Um, it's not that useful. You can you can sort of see English players going for early horsemen and going for the king and raiding with it, but it's just like a it's a lot of effort to play a weaker faction. Basically, uh, it doesn't really synergize well with what the English are trying to do right now. Um, so I completely uh, revamped it. Now you can pay to in this when you build the structure, you can pay to add any units of your choosing to the next call to crusade. So uh, and then the cost of that unit is cheaper based on how much time there is until the next crusade. So if there's 10 minutes until the next crusade and you have this building, you might be able to train knights that are 70 percent off. Um, you won't see you won't see that knight you won't see that investment until it arrives but once your crusaders arrive they will be that much stronger so this is a way to kind of invest for a more powerful future army uh, which i think 
is a really interesting mechanic and could make this uh, a much more um, powerful uh, landmark. So you can imagine even going for a build where like maybe you uh, don't invest in any early military and instead you pour all of those resources into um, into your abbey here. And so that way when the crusaders do arrive, you will have that much bigger of an army. But in order to do that, you needed to basically uh, make a gamble that your opponents are not going to destroy you in time. And if your opponents see this landmark, they're going to be thinking, oh, well, if he built this landmark, then that means that I need to attack him now, because by the time the Crusaders arrive, their army is going to be massive and they're going to destroy me, uh, yada, yada, yada. So I think this is a really interesting mechanic that uh, will mix up the way you play and make this landmark potentially more viable. Uh, White Tower uh, for in H3. Very strong landmark right now. I'm keeping it exactly the same. Uh, it will be, however, a little bit weaker in the sense that uh, you won't get the network of castles benefit from it. Um, but otherwise, this landmark is already pretty loaded. So I feel like it's still pretty good even without that bonus. Uh, the King's Palace, uh, as a result, may be a little bit better now, maybe a little bit more attractive because, um, oh, actually, I guess, never mind. The King's Palace also gives the network of castles bonus for the base English Civ. Uh, so in this case, you won't get that here either. But I mean, you still get to reap the rewards of having a second town center so um uh, potentially a really good option for a fast castle play so imagine i imagine this english variant playing more like an english uh, faction that enjoys doing a fast castle that gets a lot of benefit from it because they can go for sacred sites and they can get these order knights and everything like that uh and then in the imperial age we have the berkshire pal the the bark boxer boxer palace uh acts as a keep uh, has a ridiculous amount of range. I'm keeping this exactly the same. Uh, the one thing that I think would be interesting here, however, is that the the base English faction's boxer, uh, oftentimes you will see it either placed uh, on the front lines where you uh, can cover a lot of uh, map control, or you can place it in the back of your base where it defends all your farms. Uh, I think that the Richard of the Lionheart variant will want more often to place it next to a sacred site to secure uh, a lot of ground with it. Um, so it might be a little bit more interesting to see that happening uh, rather than having uh, this thing defend your farms. Um, the Weingard Palace is something I'm changing significantly though. Right now, this is a landmark that's not really used. It trains batches of units for a really cheap cost, um, but it doesn't, it's not too exciting right now. And it gives some unique units that just nobody really trains. So uh, instead, this is going to be the palace that really upgrades Richard the Lionheart. Um, it provides a lot of technologies that are unique that will uh, upgrade Richard. And it will also grant him the ability to summon a trebuchet, which summons a free trebuchet. This is very similar to Jean d'Arc getting the ability to summon a cannon for free, uh, although it's a little bit less bullshit because you do have to build this landmark to uh, get this ability. And it's just a it's just a trebuchet, and it's not a big ass uh, cannon uh, along with. Um, uh, uh, some some companions uh, so yeah I think this could be interesting if you want to do for go for a more Richard centric play uh, rather than going for more like you know economic or sacred site focused play uh, and those technologies related to Richard are um, I gave them very generic names but Valor uh, which in this case uh, uh, makes a Richard's AoE healing effect now also persist in combat normally the King's AoE healing doesn't work in combat it has to work uh, only when they're out of combat so now it he also heals in combat, which is pretty damn strong. Uh, unyielding uh, uh, doubles the duration of the invincible ability. So uh, right now, Richard can make all of their, all of the units around him invulnerable for um, I think it was three seconds. So now they're invulnerable for six seconds, which means that the moment he casts this ability, you're gonna have to get the get the hell out of dodge and uh, not try to engage because it is gonna destroy your army if he does that. Obviously, the numbers are not final, so you know I'm sure that number could be tweaked to be whatever feels more balanced. Uh, I'm just throwing out a number just to give you an idea. Um, and then lastly, Warrior King. Richard will take 50% reduced range damage. So this is very similar to the Jean effect. Uh, Jean d'Arc gets 50% uh, reduced range damage when she reaches level 3. Richard has to uh, get this technology in a landmark to get that same thing. Because this effect is kind of bullshit. Um, so, but I do want to give uh, players who want to focus on Richard uh, a little bit more survivability here. Um, all right. And uh, yeah, that's... I think the whole design here, um, I can't think of anything else I want to call out. Uh, well, yeah, thanks for listening. Um, if you enjoyed this, uh, I hope you got, I hope you will leave a like and consider subscribing if you haven't already. Uh, and if you 
like what I did here, let me know in the comments below if you have ideas for what you would want to see an English Civ, uh, English variant Civ do. If you have ideas on how you think Richard the Lionheart should work, uh, if you dislike my concept at all, feel free to let me know in the comments. I'd love to start a discussion with you guys. Uh, it's always a lot of fun to talk about this stuff. Um, and yeah, if you want to see more uh, concept videos like this, uh, let me know in the comments and I will see you next time. Until then, stay frosty, stay chilly.